Romans 8, verse 1, there is, therefore, now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, Paul uses the word, therefore, 27 times in Romans. And that's fitting since he is systematically laying out a logical argument. The adverb therefore is used when drawing a conclusion based on what was previously said. He's making a case, therefore this, and therefore that, and therefore the other. And so when we come into Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation. Notice, therefore, now no condemnation. So he's very clear He's talking about those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so there is no condemnation to believers who walk after the Spirit under grace. But based on what Paul demonstrated in Romans 7 concerning the inability of the flesh under the law, there is a temporal condemnation on believers who walk after the flesh by putting themselves under the law. Now we're going to see in Romans 8 when he's talking about being carnally minded and walking after the flesh and the things of the flesh, he's talking about trying to perform under the law. That's specifically what he's talking about in this context. If you don't think there's condemnation for a believer, I'm obviously no eternal condemnation. That's very clear in Romans. But what did he say at the end of, of Romans 7? He said in verse 24, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That sounds like condemnation, which is understandable because in 2 Corinthians 3, he says in verse number 9, about being under the letter of the law, 2 Corinthians 3, 9 he said, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. God gave the law. It was glorious. It's his word, but more excellent. What exceeds is what, how God's dealing with us under grace because of the blood of the New Testament and that we serve a newness of spirit. But there is condemnation. Now, look, Paul warns believers. I mean, that's why he wrote Galatians, right? <laughs> you, you can be deceived in putting yourself under the law as a believer. He said, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? You were saved and justified by grace. Why are you going to put yourself back under the law trying to be sanctified? And uh, he talked about that in 1 Timothy. He said that they swerve aside, desiring to be teachers of the law. And, and when people turn away from the sound doctrines of what it means to be under grace, they inevitably gravitate back toward the law. And so it's possible for someone who's justified by grace to be deceived into putting themselves back under the law. And what you'll find there is condemnation. Now, you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot lose being justified because it's the righteousness of Christ. But you will experience a temporal condemnation in this life by trying to live under the law. And Paul, you look, see, a lot of people say, what are you talking about? Because uh, you can't, a believer can't be condemned. You better read the Bible again because Paul used the word condemnation in regard to believers. You've got to look at the context of the word. Condemnation's not always talking about going to hell. Just like salvation's not always talking about going to heaven. You've got to look at the context of how it's being used. So, but because people, when they, when they see no condemnation, Romans 8, 1, they assume that the issue here is eternal security, and so they get nervous about the second part of the verse. <laughs> They're saying, is Paul teaching you only have eternal security if you walk after the Spirit? That can't be. Therefore, we better, we better help God and change His Word so we can make it what we want it to be. And you know what all the modern versions do. They omit the last 10 words of Romans 8.1. And that's what most commentaries will say needs to be done. And The last 10 words of verse 1 where it says, 
who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, they are omitted in most of the modern versions, if not all of them. I hadn't checked all of them, but most of them I've seen, they omit these words. And, and the translators claim, uh, what they claim is, they say, well, these, are not, these words are not in the best manuscripts. What are they talking about? Well, they're talking about Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which are not the best manuscripts. They're among the worst. They're totally corrupt. We've proved that before in other studies. You understand there is a pure stream of manuscripts that flow into the King James Bible. And the Lord said in Psalm 12, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So we know based on the promise of preservation that God's words would be kept pure throughout all generations. So we should expect then to find down through history pure manuscripts. Well, likewise, the Bible warns us in a number of places about those who would corrupt the word of God. Paul said, in fact, in 2 Corinthians 2.17, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Many corrupt the Word of God, not a few. <laughs> and so most, look, the Bible's being produced today in English. All these new versions, we can prove to you, beyond any shadow of doubt, they are all corrupt because words have been added, words have been changed. There's, there's errors, there's bad doctrine, and, and that's to be expected because the first thing out of Satan's mouth in Genesis 3 to man was, Yea, hath God said? That's what he's all about, attacking the Word of God. And so you'll find that there's a pure stream of manuscripts, there's a corrupt stream. Now, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, I'm not going to get all the details of that. We've taught on that before. But those, those manuscripts are, are terrible. And yet they were used as a basis, Westcott and Hort bringing them in as they devised their own Greek text to try. And that's where the modern versions, where, where they have the corrupt readings, they're going by that corrupt Greek text. But anyway... It, it, yeah, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, it's no, not a surprise to me that they would omit those words. They omit a lot of things. <laughs> they omit whole books of the Bible. And they're very corrupt. I mean, you know, you're going to trust a manuscript found in the Vatican Library. Uh, you're going to trust a manuscript found in a monastery on Mount Sinai in a trash can. Basically, at the, that's what it was. I mean, it's just... So I, 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 got a, I got a lot to get to, so I can't, <laughs> I feel, I'd like to park there a while, but y'all know what I'm talking about, I hope. Okay, the self-appointed Bible correctors, they, what, they'll, what they'll do in Romans 8, 1, when they come to the end of the verse, they say, now this is an unfortunate rendering. This is a scribal gloss. And what they claim is that somewhere along the line, a scribe that was copying the passage mistakenly took the words from verse 4 and added them into verse 1. In verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so, if you know anything about how the scribes did their work, I mean, this is so far-fetched, it's ridiculous, that a, a scribe actually sat down and, and put you know, words from verse 4, copied them in verse 1, and then ever since then, everybody's been making the same mistake. It's nonsense. And uh, a marginal note in the Old Schofield Bible says, these words are interpolated, which means they were inserted or added to the original. And that is something you got to watch out for in these so-called study Bibles. Well, anytime, I don't care who they are. And if you agree with them on other things, and when a man casts doubt on the Word of God, he's wrong 100% of the time. Schofield was wrong. And he was wrong in Mark 16 and, at when, and, and 1 John 5, 7, for an example, where in his notes he says these weren't in the best manuscripts and, and kind of implies they ought to be omitted. He's wrong. Anybody who casts doubt on the Word of God is giving place to the devil when they're doing that. I don't care. You say, well, what, can a saved man? Yeah, a saved man can give place to his flesh, which is to give place to the devil. He can be deceived. And any man that tries to cast doubt on what God said, you're to reject what he's saying right there. That's totally false. So what this is is just a classic example of men trying to change the Word of God 
when they don't understand it. Right? Because they don't understand the verse in its context, they think that it's implying a believer can lose salvation. We've already seen in Romans that a believer can't lose salvation. Paul is not an idiot. I mean, he's not contradicting himself. He's writing by inspiration of God, and, but because they don't understand what's going on in the context, they then try to tamper with the Word of God to make it line up with their limited understanding. But we must change our beliefs to match the Word of God and never change the Word of God to match our beliefs. Okay, the Bible is right 100% of the time. There are no errors in the King James Bible. And if you come across something you don't understand, that's, 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 that's your issue. The issue is not the Word of God. What you need to do is submit to the authority of the Word of God, pray for light, seek God, and, and don't tamper with His Word, and maybe you'll start understanding it. But you see these arrogant men sit in judgment on the Word of God and say, well, I don't like the way that's worded, so let's change it. No, that's, that's the wrong approach to the Word of God. We must believe what the Bible says even if we don't understand. Hey, there are things in this Bible I do not understand, but I know it's right. I'm not going to change it. I'm, I'm just going to leave it as it is, keep believing it, keep studying it, ask God to show me the truth about it. And, and I believe he'll give us further light as we study his word with a believing heart. We must approach the Bible in humility and faith. And when you come to the Bible with the attitude that you're your own final authority and you're going to check different manuscripts and versions to see what, what reading you like and you're going to start trying to make the word of God line up with what your, what your ideas are, you're in trouble. That's always the wrong approach to the word of God. Now, the King James Bible is perfect because it is the inspired words of God preserved in the English language. And I'm telling you that when you alter just one word, you throw things all out of sorts and you cause a problem. I mean, if you were to omit those last words in verse 1, you've just messed up what's being taught here. You just messed up the passage. God's word is exact. It's precise. Let me give you a, a, an example in the immediate context in verse 3. Look how precise and exact the Word of God is. In verse 3, notice where he said, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, that is very precise and exact in how it's worded. And if you tampered with it just a little bit, it would it, it'd be a real problem. It would not have been doctrinally sound to say, for an example, Christ came in sinful flesh because he was without sin. He, was, he had flesh, but it wasn't sinful flesh. If you were to try to word it that Christ came in the likeness of flesh, that would be wrong because he actually had flesh. If you were to try to word it Christ came in the flesh, even that would be wrong because he, he still has, look, he rose bodily from the grave and has an immortal flesh and bone body after the resurrection that's not in the likeness of sinful flesh. The exact and precise wording is that Christ, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. I mean, that, that you, you tamper with that just a little bit and you've got major doctrinal problems. I'm going to show you something. I don't have this in my notes, but let, hold a marker here. Flip back to Luke 23. I'm going to give you another example, even about punctuation, okay? Because I'm telling you that the King James Bible is beyond the capability of the translators, as brilliant as they were. I believe God was involved in making sure we had exactly what he wants us to have. And I don't say that with any apology. I don't say that with any hesitation. I believe that it proves itself to be the pure word of God. It's been proving itself to be the pure word of God over 400 years. The evidence is there. And it, you, you start tampering with it, and you throw things out of whack, and you cause major problems... And um, in Luke chapter number 23, for an example, notice in verse 43, Jesus said unto him, this thief on the cross next to him, Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And there are people who want to teach soul sleep, and that when you die, there's no consciousness. And that what they'll do with this verse, they say, well, you know, the punctuation's not inspired. So let's move the comma. And say, verily I say unto thee today, comma, thou shalt be with me in paradise one day. <laughs> but what is the truth here? 
when Jesus died, his soul went down into paradise in the heart of the earth. And this thief that repented, he also went into paradise that day. They were conscious. The Bible teaches that when you die, it's, it's, it's a separation. Physical death, your soul and spirit depart your body, separate from your body, but you remain conscious. And the Bible teaches that in a number of places. And so what they want to do is they want to play this game about the punctuation and say because the punctuation wasn't in the original, therefore we can monkey around with it. But you start doing that, you're going to teach heresy, you're going to teach false doctrine. And look, by the way, that would be, I mean, for Jesus to say, verily I say to you today, well, what other day was he saying it? That, I mean, that's dumb. I mean, to say, I'm telling you this today. No, verily I say unto thee, comma, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When they died, they went to paradise that day. That's the clear meaning of the text. Now look back in verse 32, let me show you. How exact, how precise, even the punctuation. I, my, my point in all this this morning is you can trust the Bible, okay? I, I, I cannot, when I hear a man casting doubt on God's word, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. And the hair stands up on the back of my neck, and I almost feel like punching him in the mouth, to be honest with you. Because this is the holy word of God, okay? You don't tamper with the word of God. And so in, in Luke 23, verse 32, there were also two other malefactors, criminals, led with him to be put to death. Watch it. There were also two other, comma, malefactors. Take the comma out, what do you got? You got Jesus being a malefactor, right? You understand? In other words, the Bible doesn't call Jesus. He was an innocent. He was innocent. He was falsely accused, and he laid down his life for us is why he suffered and died. But the, the Bible is very clear. There were also two other comma, malefactors, comma, led with him, separating the actual malefactors from the Son of God. You took the comma out, and you made him a malefactor. You see that? That's precise. I can go there in Galatians chapter 3 where Paul made a doctrinal point on one letter, seed, not seeds. I mean, it goes on and on with the precision of the Word of God. All right, Romans chapter 8. So when you're reading a commentary or listening to a Bible teacher or preacher and they come to a verse like Romans 8 verse 1 and says, this is unfortunate, just think, no, it's unfortunate you don't believe the Word of God. You've got to have those last 10 words. That's the point in the context. Okay, he's going to develop this issue of what it is to walk after the Spirit. And if you don't walk after the Spirit, then there is a, a condemnation for believers in this life. I mean, in light of the doctrine already set forth in this epistle, we know verse 1 cannot mean it's possible for a member of the body of Christ to lose salvation if they don't walk after the Spirit. Because let's face the fact, most members of the body of Christ today, it seems, aren't walking after the Spirit because most of them are putting themselves back under the law because of, of bad teaching that they sit under. And, and so, but if, Paul said in, in 2 Timothy 2 that if you get led astray by false doctrine, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord know with them that are his. He talked about they have their faith overthrown, but you can't overthrow the foundation. Okay? In fact, at the end of Romans 8, how about verse 38 and 39? I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what you call eternal security. Okay? You're justified, declared righteous, and it's the righteousness of Christ. If you were to lose that, then that would mean Christ failed. You're sealed with the Spirit. If you were to lose it, that means the Spirit failed. God gave you His promise. If you were to lose it, that would mean the Father failed. No, it, our salvation is in God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it's a done deal. It's guaranteed in Romans 8. It's going to lay it out. In fact, it's so sure, Paul's going to talk about how we are glorified, past tense. Even though we haven't experienced it yet, it's predestinated. It cannot fail. We will be glorified. So, what is the point then in verse 1? There's no eternal condemnation to those who are in Christ. That's, that's very clear in Romans. However, a believer can bring temporal condemnation on themselves in this life if they put themselves 
if they give place to the flesh and put themselves back under the law. Let me prove it to you for an example in Romans 14, verse number 22. Do you th the Bible's clear there is a sort of condemnation. Not eternal, obviously. You can't be condemned to eternal damnation once you've been justified. But there is a temporal condemnation in this life you can bring upon yourself if you don't walk by faith. Romans 14, 22, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. That's not talking about eternal damnation. The damned there is the same idea as condemned. And you're condemned of yourself because of how you're going about this. Because he eateth not of faith, whatsoever not of faith is sin. Now we'll explain that context when we get to it in about five years, you know, but in Romans 14. But the thing is, is that that's talking about believers, right? How about 1 Corinthians 11? 1 Corinthians 11, <clears throat> verse 27, about the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord unworthily had to do with the fact that the carnal Corinthians were observing the Lord's Supper with divisions. It was the way they were going about it. Christ shed his blood and died on the cross to form one body. In 1 Corinthians 10, he said, we're one bread, one body. And so you're to observe this uh, in union, in unity. We, ought, we have union in the body of Christ, and we need to observe it in unity. And so it, it is an unworthy manner to, to partake of the Lord's Supper with divisions like they were. And he said, verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. That's not eternal damnation. He's talking to the church at Corinth, and there was a temporal damnation and condemnation they were bringing upon themselves. Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. you see the difference? The condemnation on the unbelievers is one thing. The condemnation and damnation you can bring upon yourself through disobedience in this life is something else. He said, verse number 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. All right, look, I don't, we're not going to get into the Lord's Supper issue right now. That's not the point. We've taught on this passage a number of times. I'm sure we will again. But all I want to point out to you here was the church at Corinth coming together unto condemnation. Yeah, that's the whole point of the passage. And he's warning them, you better correct this abuse of the Lord's Supper. That's why you're dealing with the problems you're dealing with. And, 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 and you do, if you continue to do this, it's condemnation. These are safe people that have a damnation and a condemnation. Not eternally, but temporally. Okay? And that's why Paul said in 1 Timothy 5.12 about a... He was talking about Christian women when he said, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And, well, obviously, there, by the way, there's different kind of deaths. There's, there's a number of different kind of deaths in the Bible. It's not always talking about physical death. Death is a separation. You've got to look at the context, and, and there's, there's different condemnations and salvations. You, context is key. But what he said in that passage in, in 1 Timothy 5 he said that they have damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And it's clear he's talking about believers having damnation. Same thing as condemnation. All right? So, what is he, these, all these verses, just like in Romans 8, verse 1, has to do with our temporal state. Understand the difference between the believer's standing and state. Our standing is our unchangeable position based solely on who we are in Christ. Our state is our changeable condition based on whether or not we're walking by faith after the Spirit. So those who walk after the Spirit do not put themselves under the law. 
In Galatians 5.18, Paul said, If ye be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Okay, Galatians 5.18, you need to understand Romans 8 verse 1 in light of that cross reference. Romans 8.1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, and all believers are in Christ, but he specifies who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There are people that are in Christ walking after the flesh, and there is a condemnation that they can experience in this life as a result. But if you walk after the Spirit, if you be led of the Spirit, walking after the Spirit means you're following as He's leading. And how is He leading? He's not leading you under the law. <laughs> Where is He leading you? To know who you are in the body of Christ and what it means to be under grace. You follow that? So... It, this is practical. This has got to do with our state, not our standing. I will leave this possibility if you want to say, and by the way, in Romans 8, there, there are things that are very practical about our state. There's also some positional truth about our standing. They're both in Romans 8. It's not an either or type of situation here. But if you think Romans 8, 1 is about the standing and not the state, then I'll, I'll submit this to you. How about this? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Look down in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So it's possible that actually those last ten words in verse 1 are not a conditional clause, but a descriptive one in that all believers have been led of the Spirit to put their trust in Christ and not in their flesh. <laughs> now, all believers walk after the Spirit to some extent. Not all are walking after Him as they should on a daily basis, but we've all been led of the Spirit to put our trust in the finished work of Christ instead of our flesh for justification. Okay. So again, I want to make sure you get that. There's therefore now no condemnation. The therefore is looking back. Look, in Romans 7, he, he demonstrated what it looks like when you put yourself under the law. The flesh being under the law brings a condemnation in this life. There is therefore, so the therefore looks back on verse, chapter 7. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Because, see, Romans 7 verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That, that's the experience of walking after the flesh. But, verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what Romans 8 is all about, walking after the Spirit. Okay? Okay. 